safety. And um, uh, I wanted to spend like a minute talking about how I came to having this uh, topic for my senior lecture. Mostly, you know, if you're an EMI, you spent five years at this institution and at other various institutions. And one of like the ticking questions is like, how do we, you know, function as a hospital the way we are? How do other institutions function? Which, what drives them to deliver the kind of care that they give? Um, this is not by any means a knock at Downstate or Kings County, but this is more, you know, uh, a philosophical debate or self-question is what can we do as providers, individuals to do the best we can for our patients and try to, you know, reinvent our own wheels. So a lot of this in inspiration came from um, spending time at Memorial Sloan Kettering of the, well, the top is MSK, the bottom is Kings County. And, you know, this was a major influence for this talk, mainly because at MSK, you know, although they do have lots of money, they have a main goal of treating patients with cancer. But, you know, the, it's un, completely undeniable, however, that their success is vastly attributed to their culture of safety. Um, their culture consists of individuals, despite answering to different hospital standards and roles. All of them come together to expeditiously provide services to their patients. And just to give you an example, a lot of the providers communicate in ways that I've never seen before at either of our hospitals. Everyone's talking to each other by email in real time. So for instance, if you have a patient and they need to get like an expedited appointment with a surgeon in a couple of days, literally everyone knows each other. They shoot an email and then autom automatically like the clinic coordinator CC'd on the response with the surgeon who says, okay, yeah, I'll overbook my clinic for, uh, for this Friday, send the patient. And is this kind of, th that's the main question that, you know, came to my mind, like, how do you get an institution to get everybody from top down physicians, nurses to work in such a manner? And although they do get a lot of money, they're not getting paid for their emails. You know, they're not getting paid to pick up the phone, you know, and part of that question comes back to us. You know, we love Kings County. We chose to, you know, come here and train here and, you know, what can we do in our part to make this a better place for our patients? Um, so this talk is essentially an overview about this, you know, philosophic topic. So, you know, culture of safety isn't just patient safety. You know, it doesn't just save our patients from bad events. It's a, in, in my opinion, it's a misnomer for patient safety, or should I say it just doesn't lead to improvement in patient safety. You know, it's a set of ideas, norms, social institutions that are held by a common group of people, and they... Uh, they protect their input and output on the practice of medicine at their institution. You know, it has broad implications. Um, it is a social fabric for our communication, camaraderie, oversight for our physicians, nursing staff, ancillary protection, and contributing to the needs of the patients that we serve. And, you know, uh, we're experiencing an evolution in the practice of medicine that is totally interfaced with technology. That means we spend less time with our patients. We have to spend more time on the computer. And we have to provide complex care and coordination. Multiple caregivers are involved, multiple handoffs, leaving room for miscommunication at every turn. You know, on average, a te teaching hospital will do 4,000 handoffs a day. That's a 1.6 million handoffs a year. Those are all room, that's all room for error. So I'm gonna, this was my introduction. I'm gonna talk about how hierarchy alone is not enough of a model which is the co most common model of a hospital. A hospital is a business at the end of the day. They need to generate revenue so that they can provide services for their patients. But does that also mean that it provides the culture of safety needed to innovate and provide the best care for their patients? And then I'm gonna, the bulk of this talk stems from the uh, IHI and their components of culture. And I'll go through that and do a little bit of a deep dive and then offer a conclusion. So uh, the problem with hierarchical nature of healthcare is that it can often breed disrespect and abusive behavior. And I'm not talking about this institution or various others. It's just how things are. 90% of the nurses experience verbal abuse at some point in their careers. Trainees and are vulnerable, like us, to receive disrespect and mistreat mistreatment as well. And, you know, sometimes the hospital business model works. You know, but there is the establishment of a chain of command. There are boundaries, bosses, while needed, permeate the idea that being vocal about the needs for improvement can lead to disciplinary action, or there is some fear that my suggestions will fall on deaf ears. 
And it's not to say hierarchy is unnecessary, but there is a role for coexistence of culture of safety and hierarchy. There needs to be, this needs to be sought after actively and the establishment of culture of safety requires leadership. So does that mean that the culture of safety can be analogous to a chain? You know, some can argue that we are as strong as individual links in a chain. Each link is important. There may be different roles, but when one link rusts over and falls apart, it exposes the chain to weaknesses. But not all groups function like a chain. And why is that? Why do certain groups add up to be greater than the sum of their parts, while others add up to be less? So I'm going to talk about an interesting social science experiment. This is Peter Skillman. If you're a tech nerd, you may have heard his name. Back in the early 2000s, he was the director of design at Palm, Nokia for their mobile division. He was director of design at Microsoft for their Outlook, and he's currently the director of design with Amazon Web Services. So back in the 2000s, he did what's called the Spaghetti Tower Challenge. And basically, you get 20 pieces of spaghetti, one meter of tape, one piece of string, one marshmallow, and you have to make a freestanding structure within 18 minutes. And he's done it with hundreds of participants, four-person groups from Stanford, University of California, Santa Clara, engineers, people from University of Tokyo, business school students. There were additional groups that consisted of kindergartners also. <coughs> there was one rule, the marshmallow must be on top. So the, in his observations, it's always usually the same. Business students got to work. They talked and thought about their strategy, examined materials. The kindergartners had no strategy whatsoever. They didn't analyze or share their experiences, no questions. They didn't talk much. They just stood very close to one another. They abruptly grabbed materials, and they spoke in short bursts saying, here, no, here, kind of like trying a bunch of things together at the same time. So here are some of the conclusions that came from this experiment. You know, you learn by teams, good teams, they learn the most, most successful teams, the ones that had the tallest structures, they learned by doing. They worked in parallel. Working parallel lets you see great ideas and see failures. You learn from the mistakes of others. Multiple iterations beat single-minded commitment, meaning prototype, test, prototype, test. And all projects have resource constraints. So I'm going to ask you guys a question. Who do you think won? And, and uh, probably all of us, most of us, myself included, definitely think those that had intelligence, skills, experience do a superior job. Those are the people who um, probably did the best. And this is how we think about group performance. This is entirely incorrect. So the kindergartners actually had the highest average score of any group tested by Skillman in this challenge. They had the tallest structures on average 16 centimeters higher, taller than the business students, who did the worst, by the way. <laughs> so why? Why did this happen? They didn't waste time seeking power, and they didn't sit around talking about the problem. So it's difficult to imagine inexperienced kindergartens combining to produce a successful performance. Our instincts focus, uh, focused here on the wrong details. Business students appear to collaborate, but they are engaged in status management. They are too busy trying to figure out where they fit into this large picture. Who is in charge? Is it okay to criticize someone else's ideas? What are the rules here? Too much focus on this led to the failure to grasp the essence of the problem of building this tower of spaghetti. Kindergartners should stood shoulder to shoulder, moved quickly, spotted problems, offered help, experimented, took risks, noticed outcomes, which guided them towards effective solutions. This is the problem with hierarchy. And this is how successful groups, at least through this one experiment, probably do better with functioning. This is the IHI model. I'm not going to go through every component, but culture essentially boils down to having leadership, psychological safety, accountability, teamwork, and communication, negotiation. Everyone's seen this before if you've like credentialed to put through new innovations. Um, and then the other part of maintaining this culture is having a learning system because one must feed back to the other. Transparency, reliability, improvement, and measurement, and continuous learning. <coughs> <coughs> Everyone contributes to culture. But it only works if people are supported by showing value in asking questions, seeking feedback, and suggesting innovation. What you do influences the behavior of others, and how you behave will make a difference. So a lot of this talk is going to be on psychological safety. So psychological safety. Psychologically unsafe environments stifle learning. 
Learning is a huge component for establishing your culture of safety. When you are not afraid to make or admit mistakes when you perform tasks that may not work, when you're comfortable to make suggestions or point out potential problems, you are able to make honest reflections. And this was exemplified in a 2001 experiment, social experiment by Dr. Amy Edmondson, um, when which she put, she, there was an experiment among 16 cardiothoracic surgical teams amongst various hospitals. And they all were tasked to do cabbage through a new procedure, not open heart surgery, through minimally invasive surgery using thoracoscopic um, guided techniques. And she found that when teams were able to point out problems, make suggestions comfortably, admit mistakes, they learn new procedures better. If people were uneasy to act this way, then they did not learn as well as those who had an environment of psychological safety. So on the left is a cabbage, and um, the way it works is the <laughs> surgeon does an anterior approach, thoracotomy, they put the patient on bypass, and then they cross clamp the aorta. On the right, top right, the, they put in the, the uh, the, the trocars into the chest. And then what's different here is somebody, um, uh, the surgeon or the anesthesiologist will pay, place the patient on bypass through the groin. And then in order to cross clamp the aorta, they can't do it within the chest, so they throw up an intra-aortic balloon pump. And that, at that moment, the surgeon depends on the anesthesiologist who's doing the TEE to confirm placement of the intra-aortic balloon pump. And that's different. On one side, the surgeon's doing everything. On the other side, the surgeon's depending on his entire team. The team consists of perfusionists, the cardiothoracic anesthesiologist, circulating nurse. <clears throat> so 16 surgical teams, um, it was a new concept for some. They found that the most experienced surgeon who did uh, MIS, minimally invasive surgery uh, for a cabbage, their teams did not learn the procedure well, and they did not succeed as well as the junior attending who came on and who was very eager and enthusiastic about doing a new procedure. And a big question was, why is that? And we found that success came to the teams that were more eager to learn this new procedure based on how they were composed and how they drew on their experiences. These teams were designed for learning. Leaders framed challenge that motivated the team to learn better. And they created an environment for psychological safety that fostered community fostered communication and innovation. Selection was not based on competency alone, but also based on a willingness to deal with the new and ambiguous. Very scary. Um, the leaders that were successful found that they created a free and open environment with input from everybody. The surgeons who didn't acknowledge the higher level of stress or helped that their teams or help their teams internalize the rationale for taking on a significant new challenge fared worse. And this led to frustration and resistance amongst the team members. With even nursing staff jokingly saying, I would rather commit self-harm than to have to do another procedure like this again. Um, and this was quoted in the Harvard Business Review. Neutralizing the fear of embarrassment is necessary in order to achieve the robust back and forth communication among team members that are required for lean, uh, that or that's required for real-time learning. There needs to be confidence to offer suggestions, trying things that would work or may not work, pointing out potential problems, and admitting mistakes um, were important to the teams that were successful. And it's important to contradict, they found it was important to contradict old norms. I need to hear from you because I'm likely to miss things. This repetition was very important. They heard it only once, people tend to hear, tend to not hear, or believe a message that contradicts the old norms that they're used to. So can you imagine a surgeon saying, I need your help, I need you to speak up? Because for the most part in the OR, it's the surgeon's shit. So here are the lessons. You know, important to be accessible, make clear others' opinions are welcomed and valued. Always be available, don't make people feel stupid. Ask for input. Atmosphere of information sharing can be reinforced by the learner requesting contribution explicitly. Serve as a fallibility model, meaning team leaders should further foster learning um, by admitting mistakes to the team. I screwed up. My judgment was bad in that case. It signals to others that the errors and concerns that show up can be discussed without fear of punishment. So moving on, accountability. I already touched upon this 
in the last slide, human errors can be committed by even competent, well-meaning professionals. You promote a culture of safety and accountability when you speak up about the unsafe acts while <laughs> recognizing this. Teamwork and communication. Every member is part of the same team. As a member of a team, it is our responsibility to communicate clearly and effectively and value the contribution of others. People want to feel valued. They want to feel like they're part of the team, and we have a responsibility to make that a reality. You can't carry out health care by yourself just because you work hard. It is too complicated. We have to function as a collaborative unit. Negotiation. Negotiation is another key component of culture of safety because we need to negotiate with our team members so that we can arrive to the same conclusions despite our team members having different responsibilities while taking care of the same patients. We make hundreds of complicated decisions daily and we have to negotiate each other an effective plan so that we can have genuine agreement. And you can often do this through something called appreciative inquiry. And that's basically asking simple questions to gain greater insight into the other people's needs or interests. Nursing standards and metrics also need to be maintained. PCTs have the responsibilities. There's a lack of numbers staff, but you need self-reflection to understand your own desires and interests and to see what is competing with the staff that you so desperately need to help you in taking care of your patients. Both is paramount to negotiate towards this common goal. So this leads us to the learning system and uh, the most, some of the most important components are continuous learning. And this is a huge deal with maintaining a culture of safety because it's important to be proactive. We need real-time identification and prevention of defects and harms. Harms can include both harms to patients and staff, lack of respect, medical errors, adverse events, they can weaken the chain of our culture of safety. And these processes, they require active participation. It's not just waiting until something bad happens and then bringing it to light. It's important to be conscious and mindful of all aspects of care so that if there's a need for improvement, you can discuss it, review it, and even praise it if it is working well. Reliability. Um, reliability is the ability to successfully produce a product with the same specification repeatedly, more specifically healthcare delivery to our patients. It needs to be standardized. It should be simple. There is some form of reducing autonomy, not suggesting that we offload our cognitive thinking, but we should maintain our standard of care. And if we do deviate from practice, we should educate our fellow physicians as to why we did it so that we can lead to, we could have greater reliability. And all this needs to be planned. It needs to be encouraged and nurtured. And this is where leadership is so important to maintain the supportive environment that breeds reliability. People can work, again, people can work harder and get more education, but the extra training is moot if the environment doesn't exist to support or nurture this extra hard work. And then lastly, um, improvement and measurement. This is a PDSA cycle. You can use standard tools to improve patient care delivery and processes. Doesn't necessarily improving something that wasn't working well before. If something's working well, what can you do to make it better? And this is a standard tool that you can use to study a process that you are interested in. One example that we've used in the past is I pass and using this as a model to see what can be done better. So I'm going to conclude this lecture um, with four key takeaways. Um, building a culture of safety starts with us. It takes time. Without active participation, nothing will get better for our work environment or for our patients. Psycho psychological safety is paramount. Treat your members as equals. Don't just look for input. we got to ask for it. It's like when you're working a shift, you can't expect your attending to come up to you and say, hey, you did this great. Or maybe you're in CCT and you think you botched the intubation. No one's going to come up to you and say, hey, you could have done that intubation better. You got to seek it because the room's going to be busy and there's 50 other things that everybody else is dealing with or thinking about and to really achieve the goals that you want you have to go get it and for having a improved culture of safety we have to get it accountability um, again competent well-meaning professionals can make mistakes all unsafe acts should go recognized continuous learning self-explanatory and reliability has to be planned encouraged and nurtured the environment must be supportive hard work alone does not lead to us being more reliable we must be cognizant and conscious about it 
So this is a thank you to everyone in this residency. Um, it is my fifth year, and um, I just want to point out that I would not have trained with anybody else anywhere else. I included Ray because he was absent from this. Uh, is he cut off? No, he's right there. All right. Um, and then, you know, to be honest with everybody, when I close my eyes and think back to residency, I think of this group of people. I miss them dearly every day. Uh, some of them are still here. Some of them are elsewhere doing great things. And of course, my ride or die, EMIM fives, um, except for Ted, he's graduating next year, but you get the idea. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'll be happy to take questions, but that's the end of my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Sure. Any questions, comments? Thank you. So this was from Natan. Um, uh, his main comments were, there is still fear of reprisal for reporting and bringing up issues, but we should be you know, cognizant and still continue to do so so that we can make a better environment for our patients. Thank you.